Well, good evening, friends, and welcome to the Westport Library in this cold, blustery, but beautiful evening just a few days before Thanksgiving. I'm Bill Harmer, the Executive Director of the Library, and I just want to thank you all for coming out for this very important program featuring some of our local heroes. As we honor our veterans during the month of November, whether they are from World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, or freshly back from tours of Afghanistan, let us remember that it is not enough to just thank them once a year on Veterans Day. Instead, we must work all year round to ensure that those who gave their lives are acknowledged and honored. Do we have any veterans in the audience tonight? And if so, would you please stand? So to all of you, and to all those men and women who serve or who have served to the fallen and to their families, there is no tribute, no commemoration, no praise that can truly match the magnitude of your service and sacrifice. Tonight, we will look back at a war that left this country with more questions than answers. And we'll learn firsthand about the experiences of four men who served our country during Vietnam. They chose to serve a cause that was greater than self, many even after they knew they would be sent into harm's way. To get the discussion started, I'd like to introduce our good friend, Mr. John Brandt, United States Navy, retired, who will be leading our discussion tonight. John, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bill, and uh, good evening, everyone. I should tell you that this is not my first time addressing a group here at the library. Uh, the first time was in 1948 at the um, children's reading room. Um, I was five. And they asked me to read a few pages of Tip and Mitten, and I screwed it up. This evening should be different. At least I hope it is. Uh, this evening we're going to share a limited, very personal view of the Vietnam War and its impact through the eyes of four Westport veterans. First, we'll, we'll see excerpts from an interview we arranged with Jay Dernberger. As you know, Jay was a Huey pilot in country. And then Jay will be joined by three of his friends, also Westport vets, in a taped interview that we did some weeks ago. With 50 years of perspective since their return, they look back with us to a time when Walter Cronkite brought us the news once a night, not minute by minute on our telephones. As you'll hear, some of what the panel suggests is that we haven't learned the lessons of that war that they survived and continue to make some of the same mistakes. But we all have lessons learned they have lessons learned and memories that they're going to share with us tonight. Um, as they tell their stories, it may sound routine and ordinary, even normal, sitting here dry and warm in Westport Library's 12th Forum. But keep in mind that with the tincture of time and distance, things have softened and hard edges have smoothed. There was a lot of fear and that fear will be brought out during the question and answer period, and I'm counting on you to do that for us. So here's Jay Durenberger. Jay is a, is a, is a very uh, self-effacing fellow. When you accuse him of being a hero, he, he, he blushes. But in point of fact, Jay and his three comrades will be telling a story tonight that capture the impact of Vietnam 50 years later. And as I said, after the screening, the panelists will come up here and take your questions live on stage. So here then is Jay and his three comrades telling you the story 
of their experience in Vietnam. The Vietnam War was a centerpiece of a decade marked by unprecedented domestic conflict and a military incursion that expended huge amounts of the nation's capital, tragically costing more than 58,000 American lives. Witnessed from various vantage points, it was a decade that many of us survived, some in uniform and some as part of a nation divided, seeking a route to peace. During the heart of the conflict in 1968 and 1970, Westport's Jay Durenberger had a front row seat. Beginning on New Year's Day 1968, then United States Army Captain Jay Durenberger began serving his active tour of duty in Vietnam as a combat helicopter pilot with the 1st Cavalry Division as a flight leader and operations officer. And as you'll hear, it was both demanding and dangerous. For his meritorious service, flying a fully armed Huey in a combat zone, Captain Durenberger was awarded the Silver Star, the Distinguished Flying Cross, the Bronze Star, the Air Medal with 22 Oak Leaf Clusters, and the Vietnamese Cross for Gallantry with Silver Star. For this oral history project, in his own words, retired United States Army Captain Jay Durenberger. I anticipated doing this. I always felt there was something that I ought to do. There's some sort of national service. I'm speaking now 50 some odd years later. But uh, You got there at, at a very interesting there. time. Yeah, uh, right at midnight on New Year's Eve. It transitioned from 1967 to 68. Mm -hmm. In fact, flying into Benoit, which is the big air base that we went to, which isn't too far from Saigon, uh, we could see flares and firecrackers and fireworks going off in celebration of the new year. It was very odd. What, what type of a crew did you have on the, on the aircraft itself, and how many people could you carry? Yeah, so the Huey, uh, the H model that I flew, uh, had a capacity of a uh, crew of four. There was two pilots and two crew members in the back, a crew chief and a gunner. Once you got airborne, they were both gunners because we were armed with uh, 60 caliber machine guns. Sure, one on each, because the doors opened on both sides, yeah. so you had one on the rails on exactly. each side. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And so but, the, uh, but interestingly, those weren't considered to be gunships. You were the troop carriers, but you had gunships. that for, for uh, your own self-protection and for suppressing fire as you flew into the LZ. Yeah, I think it was more decorative than uh, <laughs> uh, instrumental, but... Uh, but the ship could carry, first of all, it would fly about 120, 130 knots, 130 miles an hour or so. And uh, it could get up in the uh, uh, moist conditions in Vietnam. If you got to 10,000 feet, you're really wobbling. You don't have mm -hmm. a lot of controls. A typical mission would be six lift helicopters, uh, Hueys, mm -hmm. uh, normally carrying troops into the combat zone or maybe picking them up, arriving empty and taking them out. Sure. We'd be accompanied by two lower flying helicopter gunships. And then way above us would be, uh, normally they were Cobras. Uh, and we called them aerial rocket artillery. Mm -hmm. So these guys were protecting us and the landing zone and, uh, and maybe even the troops on the ground. In a typical mission, uh, how many sorties would you typically fly in a, in a single day? Well, let's say we were moving a company. So we could move a platoon with a lift of six. So it probably took us four or maybe five sorties just to complete a mission. Mm -hmm. But we might get two or three of those a day. Sure. Uh, and, you know, not all missions were that way. Sometimes they were a single helicopter. Uh, I, I often describe the toughest ones were getting people out. Mm -hmm. And the single helicopter missions usually meant the landing zone wasn't big enough. So you're in this triple canopy jungle. You had to find these guys. Mm -hmm. You find the area where you're going. No GPSs in those days. And lower yourself down through the trees, the canopy, to see if you can get on the ground. Uh, what made it tough sometimes is the guys on the ground were surrounded. And uh, getting them out, was those were the tough Sure, missions. because yeah. you're flying in under fire. And the gunships mm -hmm. didn't, couldn't support you. Is there any one particular uh, insertion or extraction that stands out in your memory that uh, really, um, really is something that you carry along with you? That yeah, there's plenty of them. Um, 
You know, I'll just say, Chris, some of the, the hardest things about doing this is dredging stuff up from 50 some odd years ago. Um, but I usually get prompted to tell a couple of stories. And so uh, one mission, which uh, I often use the term interesting, what made things interesting in these missions is you went in with sort of a plan and you had an idea and you've done this before, but it got interesting when the plan didn't work. This one uh, day we were going to take a, uh, an artillery group out to a top of a hill, and it could only the hill could only accommodate one helicopter at a time. We knew where it was. Uh, the artillery uh, unit was going to put a cannon there, you know, mm -hmm. a, a artillery piece, which would support ground activity in the surrounding area. We'd done plenty of these things, mm -hmm. and I was the flight leader. And so we assembled the flight. We've got everybody behind me. I go in first because it can only take in one helicopter at a time. No mm -hmm. problem. Guys get out. They fan out start to secure the area. The next helicopter got in, the same thing happened. Third helicopter couldn't get in. The uh, hill came under attack. And what I learned many years later was that we had actually landed on top of a North Vietnamese hospital. Oh unit, my gosh. Which was underground. Mm -hmm. And they decided to defend that, uh, that area. Not surprisingly. No, not surprisingly. Mm -hmm. So you, uh, They so probably you, evacuated, but the, mm -hmm. uh, I didn't learn that until later. So you literally poked a hornet's nest. Very much so. And so no one else could get in. And, and so I went back to pick up more troops. And it turned out for most of the day, the only helicopter that could get in was the one that I was flying. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, we went in there five times. And so once in a while, we had to take some people were killed and we brought mm -hmm. them back out. Sure. Um, later on, the battle sort of subsided. You know, the ground commander had to make a decision. Did he want to resupply this thing and keep it going? Or try to get his the first fourteen guys try to get him out, mm -hmm. and obviously they decided to to reinforce. Keep going there, so reinforce. you ended up bringing in an entire platoon, basically almost by yourself. Yeah, and then later on, everybody else got in, and you know mm -hmm. they uh, secured the uh, area mm -hmm. because there's a physical reaction to that sort of stuff. I would get so frightened, uh, and still having to control all this stuff. And plus, I was the flight leader, and in uh, coordination with the guys on the ground, that I almost couldn't talk. You just dry up. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, and then once you're released from that, like we take off, you almost couldn't stop salivating. It's a very funny physical reaction. War was going on all the time, every day, but I was in the Tet Offensive and I was in Way. Mm -hmm. uh, the, Supporting the Marines. Marines were mm -hmm. took the brunt of that. Yes. The Marines were also a on. My division replaced them. So I was there before the division came in. Mm -hmm. I was flying with Marines. And then also the invasion of the Oshawa Valley, which is half in Laos, half in uh, South Vietnam. <laughs> I've started to think in these oral histories that we probably missed some things uh, that are going on. You know, virtually everybody in the United States participated in that war. You were an active combat troop like myself and a couple of million guys that went over there, men and women. Mm -hmm. um, you uh, might have been a student. Uh, you might have had a relative that was there. You might have been um, protesting. You might have tried to get away, but six o'clock at night, you turned on the television and Walter Cronkite was telling you what was going on. And it was right in front of you. And so it dawned on me, even today, that part of this oral history probably should have been to talking to people like my mother. What was she thinking of? You know, how, how did she worry about people like me? And, uh, uh, and, I'm, and I'm sure that's covered somewhere, but uh, probably not. But everybody in the country participated in that in some way. And I'm not... You weren't always on the soldier's side. I, I think the, um, the military gave me quite a sense of, uh, of the importance of teamwork. Uh, you don't always get to choose your team, so you've got to make the best of what you've got. And maybe you're on the low man on the totem pole, so someone's trying to make the best of you. Uh, and leadership happens in the military that gets you to do a little bit more than you thought you could do. Certainly. Uh, so teamwork, mm -hmm. hard work. Preparation, and I'm not saying I was great at all of that, but that stuff was in my mind. Uh, I found this to be extremely enlightening, <laughs> and I hope that uh, everybody that's going to get a chance to watch this sometime uh, comes away a, a little bit smarter uh, for the experience of doing it. And thank you for your service, my and pleasure. thank you for uh, sharing your experiences with us tonight. Really thank, appreciate thank it. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Of course. Thanks. Thank you all for joining us. 
I'm John Brandt, an almost lifelong Westporter and a retired seaman in the United States Naval Reserve. I never served in Vietnam, but was on active duty during the conflict as a stateside instructor. At Great Lakes Naval Training Center, my exposure to the war was somewhat distant until one night an outpatient Marine with PTSD was apprehended behind my quarters with a loaded sidearm, searching for Viet Cong, who he said had infiltrated his firebase. It literally brought the war to our doorstep. The very mention of the Vietnam War conjures up a stunning array of images for most Americans who lived through one of the most tumultuous periods in our nation's history. Each of us has a ready file of images and memories that capture what happened, who was involved, what the nation thought about it, and the finality of our exit from Saigon. For most, it, it constitutes a human tragedy that endures to this day. Our four panelists, veterans all of the conflict, survived their ordeal and moved on with their lives. So let's meet today's panelists. Lieutenant J.G. Tucker Mays, United States Navy retired. Tucker enrolled in the NROTC program. Upon graduation, he flew directly to Da Nang, where he spent most of two nine-month tours in country. During this time, he operated in I Corps, close to the Vietnamese border, serving as a boat group commander and an attack cargo and troop carrier, helping to lead one vertical envelopment, amphibious landings, as well as numerous river operations with the Marine Force Recon teams. Uh, his unit's mission was to eliminate threats to the control of the Hue and other strategic waterways. Sergeant Bud Siegel, United States Air Force, retired. Bud served with the 20th Tactical Air Support Squadron, United States Air Force. It was part of a forward air controlling unit with three Cessna 01 Bird Dogs, World War II vintage, assigned to the first Arvin out of the hamlet called La Vang, outside of Quantree City. Because he supposedly spoke French, somebody thought it'd be a good idea if he sent to Vietnam. Sergeant Preston Coster, United States Army retired. After a medical challenge, Preston shipped to Vietnam as a combat engineer. He was assigned to the 1st Engineer Battalion of the 1st Infantry Division, the Big Red One. After troop drawdown, he was assigned to the 1st Administrative Division outside of Saigon, where he served two more months before entering, ending his tour of duty. Captain Jay Durenberger, United States Army, retired. Jay came home from his last college final and found that he'd been drafted into the United States Army. He went through basic training at Fort Dix, New Jersey, infantry training at Fort Benning, Georgia, helicopter flight school. He served in Vietnam in 1968, assigned to the 1st Cavalry Division, 227th Assault Helicopter Battalion as a flight leader and operations officer. His last duty assignment was with the 18th Airborne Corps at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, where he served as an aide to the commanding general. So with that biographical baseline on each of your military careers, what more would you like the audience to know about your experience in country? And what I'm looking for here really are not just a series of memorable moments, of which I'm sure there are many, but also how you felt about what you were doing. Let's start with uh, Lieutenant J.G. Tucker Mays. Thank you, thank you. Uh, the impressions I have, first, I was astounded how many of our forces were in Vietnam when I arrived. I really had no idea uh, how many of us were there. Uh, the second is that um, I had hoped to learn quite a bit uh, that would develop me as a man uh, when I was over there. And very quickly, within a few weeks, because of operations I was involved in, I learned quite a bit about myself uh, and about what I hoped this experience would teach me. So the impressions I have on Vietnam that I remember are largely positive ones. Uh, and how I responded in an environment 
thousands of miles away from my family, just weeks away from graduating from Dartmouth in a completely privileged, safe environment and being thrust in a, in a different environment that was uh, completely alien and trying to figure out how I would adjust to it. So that's just the first thing that comes to my mind. Thanks, Tucker. Next, uh, let's hear from Sergeant Bud Siegel. Well, my experience is a little bit different than most people in so much uh, I was in the reserves. I joined the reserves in 1965. I was married. Uh, I went through basic training, uh, radio school in a very abbreviated fashion. I then did my one weekend a month, two weeks in the summer. Uh, I had a six year obligation in the reserves and along came January of 1968. With the Pueblo, they activated 15,000 reservists. Uh, my unit was based out of Stewart Air Force Base in uh, Kingston, not Kingston, but somewhere up in New York, in New uh, Newburgh, New York, sorry. My wife was here. She was there at the time also. And uh, we went up to the base. I had no idea what was going to happen. We were completely ill-equipped. We probably had about a 10% combat readiness, if that. Uh, it's not like today where the National Guard and the reserves are all well up to speed. Uh, at a point in time, we got orders to go to Florida for TDY. We're in Florida for about two weeks, and lo and behold, I then get orders to go to Vietnam. Uh, fortunately, according to my wife, I'm able to compartmentalize most things, so I left, left side, right side, off I went. And when I got there, uh, I probably was the least equipped individual to be there, uh, and I quickly had to learn uh, what my job was and do it appropriately. And uh, I was then set up to a place called Levang, outside of Quang Tree. We had uh, five pilots, three Cessna uh, 01 bird dogs from World War II, a radio operator and an admin person, and two uh, aircraft engineers or maintenance guys. And that was it, and it was the nine of us, uh, along with a bunch of Vietnamese, in a compound. And uh, I was there for nine months and three days until they deactivated the reserves. And uh, I got, got, they flew me home in one day, and that was it. And uh, it was something that uh, obviously I never volunteered for. Uh, I made it through, we all made it through, the nine of us, or eight, the other eight guys, to the best of my knowledge. And I certainly learned a lot of lessons of how I get along with people and uh, how to respect people. And uh, the old story, you know, you put your, your pants on one leg at a time and you better be nice to the guy next to you because you may need him someday, et cetera. And that was, that was about it. Yep. Thanks a lot, bud. Um, and now United States Army Sergeant Preston Coster. I was uh, drafted out of Fort Hamilton, Brooklyn. And I grew up in the city my entire life. And it was then shipped to Fort Dix. And I thought initially, growing up in New York, I have seen everything on two feet. You cannot surprise me. Boy, was I wrong. I never lived with guys from Kentucky, Tennessee, Southern, real Southerners. It was a, that was a real eye opener. Uh, and, and, uh, but I also didn't understand the structure of the military at all. I was in the first combat engineer unit, which its history goes back to the Civil War. They were the first ones at Normandy. So we had all this baggage, history, whatever you want, and that was part of, as uh, John said, the big red one. And so we arrive in country, and as someone mentioned, the smell of the country is very unique and a smell that will never leave your mind. But they now, a bunch of us who arrived by plane, the CIA planes, whatever it was called, World Airways, and you're in a big group, and there's a, a sergeant on top of a platform calling out orders of what units you're going to go to and it's done alphabetically. So because I was in, when I was in Fort Dix, I contracted spinal meningitis, and 12 guys, unfortunately, there died that year. So I was always at a cycle with the people I was drafted with at that time. So we're in this group, on the, t on the guy on the platform starts calling out. First he goes to the signal division, uh, administration, et cetera, et cetera. And then he gets to the last guy, whatever his name was, Zabrinsky, I said, gee, what's going to happen to me? He always says, oh, yeah, and Coster, 1st Infantry Division. I said, you got to be kidding me. You know, 
combat engineer, your second military occupation skill is infantry. So they sent me to the Big Red One, and I wound up in the engineering unit. And uh, that's when the education and your New York wits about you had to figure out what to do. And uh, it was a million dollar experience I wouldn't give a nickel for. There was a lot of tete a tete between officers and enlisted men, or draftees as I was, because a lot of us were better educated, because we had a lot of college guys. And um, the stories are endless, some are funny, some are sad. But uh, it, all, it all worked out for me, but there's still not a day in my life where something doesn't trigger some kind of memory, positive or negative or whatever, where I hear an accident, you know, an accent of somebody I knew or a food or I see somebody or hear, hear a noise. When I got home, I was working at Wall Street at the time and a truck backfired. I went down immediately. I'm on the ground. And a guy was walking with said, Preston, get up, you're in a suit. So I got up, brushed myself off, and uh, life went on. So it, it uh, I, I, I did not feel it added anything. I know I can do what I got to do if I have to do it. But I also, as you said, there's not passing judgment. I passed a lot of judgment. I thought I was lied to by McNamara and Johnson, lied to, and I'll never forgive them for that. Uh, and seeing whatever the number is, 58,000 guys on the wall, yeah, I, I shake my head and really question the, the role that uh, we played there, which accomplished, in my opinion, nothing. Thank you, Preston. Some pretty strong emotional stuff there. And finally, United States Army Captain Jay Durenberger. So, John, your question was uh, basically, uh, how did we feel about getting there? And I've told this story before, but I was totally prepared to get off the airplane, which happened to be on January 1st, 1968, to be handled, handed a rifle, and I'd have to shoot my way in, and a year later be shooting my way out. That's the way I thought of it. I was completely wrong about that. Uh, this was the busiest place I think I'd ever seen. So we landed at Binwa, which is a big air base near Saigon. I never got to Saigon, but that, that's as close as I got. The, um, the impression that I had at that point was what unit, like Preston said, what unit and what am I going to be doing? So I'm a pilot, but just out of flight school, so I didn't have a lot of experience. And I was thinking the one place I probably don't want to go, uh, the unit I don't want to be in is the 1st Cavalry Division. Well, shoot, that's, I end up in the 1st Cavalry Division. Well, okay, so I'm there, but where I really don't want to go is north of Da Nang, in the city of Wei, uh, north of Wei. And, of course, that's where we ended up during the Tet Offensive. And so it was a pretty active life. And in a very, so a lesson learned is preparation is more important than anything. And mental alertness and physical awareness and physical conditioning uh, means a lot in conditions like that. Uh, you're stretched, or so I was certainly stretched physically and mentally very quickly. And, uh, 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 and I carry that with me uh, still. Uh, I mean, I can shirk and take naps and stuff like that. I'm 77 years old. I deserve that. But uh, hard work, preparation, those are things that stayed with me. And it, it did me well over there. And, uh, that's, uh, those were my first and maybe last impressions. Thanks, Jay. The uh, Vietnam experience had a profound effect on all of us, whether in uniform <clears throat> or on the home front. Uh, let's move forward in your lives. You've all achieved great things, perhaps in spite of your Vietnam tours, but also with lessons learned that you've applied to your lives. Tucker, you've had an active business career um, with more than generous community involvement. You've reached out to others to make life better for all of us. Tell us how Vietnam drew you to that. Thank you, it's a good question. Um, I learned uh, four or five things from Vietnam and I was hoping to learn them and I did. One was about leadership and uh, what I learned was just because uh, you have a title or a function uh, doesn't mean that you're gonna have respect and loyalty 
and trust thrust uh, upon you. And I know that uh, Preston was talking about that. You had to be very, very careful about the fact that you're very green. In my sense, in my situation, I was an ROTC graduate. But I had to earn their respect and the loyalty of my men. And I found out that one of the best ways to do that was to show them the same respect and loyalty and support that I wanted from them. And I gave it to them, and they gave it back to me. It was a great lesson. I learned a lot about structure and discipline and the hierarchy of organization and chain of command and how powerful that could be. Um, I also learned a great deal about uh, teamwork and unity of purpose and how powerful that could be behind a mission. Uh, I also learned how to communicate to people that were not the most easy to communicate to and to be clear in that communication, um, make sure they understand, understood what uh, we expected of them and also to hold them accountable. And last about planning, uh, how really important preparation that Jay referred to and planning was to success of mission, all of which I used uh, in my, my career and I think successfully. But the, what I really enjoyed most out of Vietnam, and it was surprising to me, was the coaching and the counseling and the mentoring to the boys and men um, that were uh, in my, under my command. More so the younger ones. Uh, you had to be a priest, a pastor, a psychologist, and learning how to work through the problems they had, many at home, many personal, many financial, was very rewarding to me when I was on my ship and not being involved in amphibious landing as I was or patrol operations up rivers. Um, so to answer directly your question, help me in business. And also um, later on, I really wanted to coach and teach and, and mentor. And I have done that in Westport for the last uh, about 15 years, I mentored two boys, in the Westport school system. The last just graduated. I was with him for 10 years. Um, I serve as co-chair of the Westport Youth Commission, working with uh, middle school and high school kids in youth advocacy programs. Programs, excuse me. Um, I'm on the juvenile review board in Westport, which is an alternative justice path for kids who get in trouble. I've tutored uh, Bridgeport kids after school uh, in English and computer literacy, and also taught a course to inner city um, uh, entrepreneurs, largely African Americans and, and uh, Latinos in Bridgeport, and how to start and uh, sustain a, a small business. But all of that began in, the, in Vietnam when I really loved the opportunity to coach and mentor and give back a little bit, even admittedly at a rather young age. Tucker, that, that is exactly what I was hoping to hear. But you've also had a successful career in business and have become something of a leader and a cheerleader for community arts development, this library included. Fit those pieces together for us. Well, obviously my experience was different than Tucker's because I was an enlisted man in a very small unit. So uh, I was basically not doing half the things he was doing or a quarter of the things. But what I did learn was uh, I believed in meritocracy, not time and grade. Uh, the military, military to me was time and grade, and I always felt, and a lot of corporations were that way also. Uh, eventually, in my business career, I became the CEO of the second largest metals distribution company in North America, and I can happily say it was the most profitable, with sales of over $4 billion, there were 5,000 employees. And I attribute a lot of that to what I learned in Vietnam. And that was treat people as individuals, reward them based on what they do, not what their time and grade is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and make sure that they're compensated based on what they bring to the company, whatever. Uh, so that was very important. I don't like the word cheerleader. Uh, I'm not a cheerleader. I've had a conversation with Jay over the time. I never can ask anybody for money. And that, to me, is what a cheerleader would do when it comes to the arts and things like that. Fortunately, my wife and I are in a position where we've been able to uh, provide support 
to the library, to the playhouse, to Levitt, and some other things financially, which uh, is obviously beneficial. Uh, I have more respect for people who actually provide time and, and service to these organizations than just putting money against it. But we, we're on the money side, and others do the service side. Uh, but a lot of that goes back to we've been in this town since 1976, uh, reared two children. Uh, and it's been terrific for us, and we've decided uh, we're not going anywhere. Uh, the running joke is when my wife leaves Westport, she gets hives, which is not really true, <laughs> but it, she won't leave town. So uh, we're here forever, and uh, our next home will be Willowbrook. But uh, it is what it is. That's comforting to hear, Bud. We, we need more like, like you. <laughs> Preston, you, you told us you've only had three employers, and one of them was the Army. Talk to us about how your career evolved, first in the Army and then, and then in finance. Well, it's not a career in the Army. <laughs> it's a bad job. Uh, and I definitely make a distinction between job and career. Uh, I was promoted much quicker than most of the other GI I was with, making staff sergeant on spec five. They wanted me to stay in the army, go to OCS and all that stuff. And I wanted nothing to do with it. Absolutely nothing. I just wanted to get out, do my time. I had extended three extra weeks. So when I came home, I had less than 150 days and they let you go home. But what lessons did I learn? You know, growing up in, again in New York, you've seen everything on two feet, as I mentioned. But I learned how to deal with anybody. I can deal with anybody. And when I got out of the service, I started working for JP Morgan and life moved on and I became a private banker. And I had to deal with many different personalities to some of the richest people in America, to some CEOs who don't understand the word no. And I can get along with any of them. And I learned that in Vietnam, I think. Hmm. But it's all about one word, respect. And if you respect others and listen well, they did a survey when I was at Morgan. What is the single greatest skill a junior person can have? And it was the ability to listen. And I learned that in Vietnam. You had to listen so you could figure out what you got to do and how to get out of what you got to do if you have to do it. Uh, Jay, going from the uh, cockpit of a Huey in combat to what followed uh, must have been uh, some kind of a sea change in your life. <laughs> Talk to us about that transition and the, like, the lessons you took forward that helped you succeed in, in, in business. Yeah, I was going to comment, John, if you don't mind, on some of the conversation we've just had. Because uh, certainly in my experience, uh, I think about this stuff, a little bit of it every day. And so 50 some odd years have gone by and maybe I don't think of it that crisply all the time, but something will come up and I'll remember it. And Preston, I'm probably reacting a little bit to what you're talking about. But you don't have to scratch the surface too much and you can find out that there's something down in there. The, the helicopter experience uh, is primarily a Huey. And I describe that as the Uber of Vietnam. You want to go somewhere, you give me a call, I'll pick you up and call me when you want to get back home and we'll come and get you. And it's a crew of four. There's a pilot, a co-pilot, crew chief and a gunner in the back. And everybody has a job to do. And so that's probably a big lesson in a, in a little tiny unit of only four people in a uh, you know, in a complicated machine. The, I've never really understood how it flies anyhow. And uh, you have to uh, come to an under, understanding that I've got a job and I've got to get it done because these people are counting on me and the co-pilot has a job because we're counting on him. And the bravest people of all weren't the pilots because we got somewhat of a choice of where we're going and how we're going to do this. It's the two guys in the back who didn't have a choice. They had to jump on the plane and go wherever we were going. So I've always considered them the bravest. But you needed them. If you were in a jungle situation for landing, uh, you, no rear view mirrors, no backup cameras, or no GPSs or anything like that. You needed somebody to tell you, uh, hey, Lieutenant, uh, there's a, we're up a couple hundred feet trying to go through canopies of trees. You gotta move the tail a little bit to the right and then a little bit to the left. And oh, by the way, there's somebody down here who's gonna take a shot. You trusted people. So that's a comment I think that we're all alluding to respect and so on, but trust, accountability. I need you to be prepared to do your job, just like I need to be prepared to do my job. And that sort of carries through. And I think that's a big part of what I learned. It was important. So here we are in 2021, watching the world spin out of control, 
following a frantic evacuation, an ongoing pandemic, a rapidly evolving world political situation, and seemingly no answers to many of the core questions we faced in Vietnam. Let's talk about lessons not learned and how you feel about your contribution to the country's second longest, longest war. And um, this is a round robin. Tell us what you think. I'll start. I think for me, uh, Vietnam had three lessons. First, and I'll be very blunt, America should never ever go into a war where there is not a clear and present danger to our country and our people. I was behind the war, Vietnam. I changed that rather rapidly afterwards. And I can't recall the panelists this talked about, I think it was Preston, not trusting McNamara and Westmoreland. Um, after that, my trust in our leaders dropped precipitously. So I'm with you all the way on that. Um, we never should have gone to Vietnam, although I'm proud of my time there. We never should have been in Iraq. And Afghanistan, perhaps in the beginning, when we really thought it was a threat because of uh, ISIS and bin Laden and, and all of that, we should have got out sooner. So unless it's a clear and present danger to our country, I am never going to vote for America going to war anywhere outside our borders, or of course, inside our borders. The second thing is we should never nation build. The arrogance of a country thinking that we can impose democracy on others is absurd. Uh, Churchill said very famously that democracy is the worst form of government, but um, it's the only one. No, did I get that right? Not democracy quite, but... is the worst form of government, but, but, it's the be the but, but, it's, but it's better than all the others. That's Excuse true. me. <laughs> and it is. But... Most of the uh, wars that we've been in, they're not interested in democracy. They weren't interested in democracy in Vietnam. They're certainly not interested in democracy in Iraq. They're certainly not interested in democracy in Afghanistan. So we have to learn that and trust it. One of my concerns is that because we spend $700 billion on our military every year, and this is spoken by a proud military member uh, and, a, and, a, and a Vietnam vet. I think one of the reasons we go to war is because we can. And what are we doing not using these planes and these tanks and these ships and these men? Why do we have it if we don't use it? So um, I, that's one of the lessons. Um, and the third is we have to fight when we do fight with the conditions that are in front of us. Um, the United States is not prepared to fight a guerrilla war in a jungle in Vietnam or mountains of Afghanistan. You want to take on the fifth military in the world, Iraq, we took them out in two weeks. Why? There weren't mountains, there weren't jungles. It was flat. And tanks and fighters wiped them out very fast. So when you're going to fight, and you decide to fight, and we agree to fight, please use strategies and tactics that are really aligned with the challenge in front of us. So that's what I feel. Let's move on. Sorry. Uh, actually, I agree with everything Tucker said. And the only thing I would add to it is we seem to have a propensity of trying to support corrupt governments. Uh, the government in the South Vietnam was a corrupt government. The government in Afghanistan was a corrupt government. Uh, am I missing a war? Iraq? <laughs> that Iraq was obviously a corrupt government. Goes without saying. I mean, so everything subsequent to Vietnam has been the same story. All three of these wars were supporting corrupt governments. And how are you supposed to win a war, especially a guerrilla war, when you don't have the support of the people because the people aren't happy with the people that you're supporting? Exactly. So it's a zero-sum game as far as I'm concerned. And all the things that you've said I, I agree with. I would just add that as a general statement. There's no need to support these corrupt governments. I am. Um... I agree with everything uh, the two gentlemen said, is because Congress is shifting and there are not a lot of veterans in Congress, the government doesn't understand what these weapons can do, and it's frightening what they can do. I mean, I just look at 50-year-old armaments that I had to deal with, you know, an, an M16, 
the bullet flies at a little little tip, the projectile. When it hits, it goes in about the size of a golf ball. It comes out the size of a softball. And people don't understand that, what these weapons can do. They had a, 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 a this M72 law, which is just a piece of plastic tube. You pop it open, you pull a trigger, you shoot it. It can burrow into any known armor, and once it gets inside the tank, it spins. So this stuff is amazing, and it's 50 years old technology. So I think by putting or having or electing more people who have been in the military in Congress will keep a, a lid or some kind of control on uh, what the military is up to on these bad ideas. Yeah, when I think about this stuff, I think uh, 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 two, uh, two things. Um, the f one of my last missions, I flew uh, a uh, command and control aircraft for a battalion commander. He had an operation on the ground. One of his companies was moving through a village area. And it wasn't a big deal for me. I did, did, uh, did tons of these things. And the commander wanted to land in the middle of the village. Okay, we'll see if we can do that. There's some huts and trees and so on and so forth. So we go to land, and the rotor wash from a Huey is quite immense. It blows up a lot of dust and, and wind and so on. And we blew the top off of a small grass hut. And huddled in the middle of that hut were, as I picture it 50 years later, was a man and a woman. And I thought to myself, you know, that could have been my mom and dad. And it just hit me like, what am I doing? You know, I mean, I had no intention of blowing that roof off, but what are we doing? And, and so that stayed with me. I think about that from time to time. And another thought that I had, and people will ask me about sort of loyalty and patriotism. Uh, I flew a lot of combat missions. Not one time, not one time that I say I'm doing this for my country. Not once. I was there because someone on the ground needed me. There was a mission that required... Mm -hmm me to be there. I had to help somebody or put people on the ground, but I never said, you know, I'm feeling pretty good about this um, and I, I'm glad my country is behind me and so on. It, it, it became very, very personal. Yeah, uh, I, I want to uh, take just 20 seconds to tip my hat to Jay because what Day, Jay did was really, really dangerous and he saved a lot of people. Imagine coming in slowly into the jungle totally exposed to pick up guys who are wounded and to do that kind of thing. I had a couple of buddies of mine in Vietnam who were helicopter pilots. Uh, it took them five years to finally recover from everything they went through. You did better than that, but I just want to tip my hat to you. Yeah. Well done. Uh, gentlemen, uh, thank, thank you all. It's, it, it's a pity that this is all the time that we have to devote to this subject. Thank you for your service and for your candor in sharing your experiences with us. Um, and thank you to the audience whose interest and engagement continues to make our democracy vital. We didn't talk about the food. About the food. <laughs> I, could, I could talk to you about the food in the Navy, but you'd all be really jealous. I, I think That's one of the sure. amazing things to, for, in Vietnam for me was delivering Full roasted turkeys on Thanksgiving. Absolutely. That's right. <laughs> and we went right to the smallest base camps, the smallest artillery <laughs> camps. We had the Maramite cans, right? Hot food, mashed potatoes, gravy. We drop it, drop it right on there, and that turkey was unbelievable. The best yet. Um, but on behalf of the Westport Library's Oral History Project, thank you very much for sharing your lives with us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And welcome home. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>
was an opportunity for the, for the community to expose this kind of strength. Westport is an extraordinary place with a lot of extraordinary people, you included. And now it's your turn to uh, ask questions of our, of our panelists. There's a microphone over there, and Alex is manning it. While you're thinking of your question, I have a couple. Preston? Uh-oh. You paying attention? Say again? <laughs> I can't hear that well. Compliments of Vietnam. <laughs> Preston, des describe one of your closest calls. What, what, what kept you up at night? Well, many things. Uh, you know, spinal meningitis in Fort Dix was just an extraordinary experience, unfortunately. Get closer to your microphone. Yeah, uh, getting spinal meningitis in Fort Dix. I was driving an ambulance right around Christmas time, and uh, I wound coming down with it, and I mentioned 12 guys died. Guy before me, the guy after me died, and uh, and then I was sent home on convalescent leave, and I weighed same height, six feet. I weighed 129 pounds, no hair on my head, and uh, I tried ever so hard to get out of the army. It didn't work. Uh, my father tried really hard. He knew Charlie Goodell, who was our senator in New York at the time, and that still didn't work. So uh, I go down to Fort Dix. I mean. Uh, uh, Fort Hamilton, Brooklyn, uh, took the subway, had my duffel bag over my shoulder, and I practiced going in there and saying, I'm going to die right here in front of you with spinal meningitis. And uh, uh, what did I know? They immediately checked my blood. They said, fine. They shipped me off to Fort Dix. Uh, typical, but I was always out of sync, as I said, and I would I had an attitude, no question about it, and as a lot of college guys did, had attitudes. But you'd make the best out of it, and, and uh, I looked for opportunities. I could drive sticks, I could drive trucks, uh, I could type. So I used all these things that I, I learned growing up and in school. And, but as we all said, there's not a day that doesn't go by where something doesn't trigger a memory, both good and bad. And uh, it's just one of those things you live with. But looking at those um, dinky little planes that you were responsible for, I'm kind of curious uh, what kind of targets you found. Were you looking for fighters or bombers, and did you ever find any of the results of what you, pr what you produced? Uh, yeah. Uh, basically, my job was to uh, control the fact. I was the radio operator on the ground, liaison liaisoning with the Vietnamese, and... Uh, they would, the facts would then mark the target with their smoke rockets, and they'd work the fighters, and the fighters would go after the smoke because they would be going too fast, uh, and they couldn't see basically what was on the ground except for the smoke. And then they would have, uh, after it was all over, the fact would go in and, and survey the damage, if any, and uh, report back. And so we knew exactly theoretically what had occurred. Obviously you don't know exactly, but you have a general idea of what occurred, what was there, what was not there. Usually it was bunkers and things like that. But uh, number one, you said I was in the Army when you introduced me. I was not in the Army. Uh, no intention of being in the Army. I was Air Force. And uh, the other thing is, is I made the crack about speaking French. I was living in Brussels with my wife when this whole thing started and I came back because they were not drafting married men, they were changed drafting married men. And when I tried to get in reserve units, I said that I was fluent in French, uh, which was not true, but I could get by. So what I did learn even prior to the military was never to overdo my resume again. <laughs> so I had forgotten that one. My wife keeps reminding me of that. <laughs> Once a year, um, a group of veterans goes to uh, Bedford Middle School and talks to the eighth grade uh, about their military experience. And one of the things that um, we talked about this year was a lesson that a number of our veterans mentioned tonight, and that was the importance of situational awareness, what's going on around you. 
Anybody have any thoughts about how important that is? It's everything. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. It's, it's, it's everything. Uh, you have to be aware of your environment at all times. Uh, and part of that is again, growing up in New York, but Vietnam fine-tuned that skill. Uh, I was going to comment on a, uh, I just heard this a day or so ago, but I guess President Eisenhower uh, around uh, D-Day was saying that uh, plans don't count for anything, planning counts for everything. And so that's basically what are your resources, what is around you, uh, what can you call on, how do you communicate, because the plan probably isn't going to work. And you're going to need all of that information from your planning exercise. So that's situational awareness, and very important. Mike Tyson famously said <laughs> that everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face. Yeah. And in, uh, in war, you get punched in the face all the time. And you must uh, always have situational awareness because often, I might even say rarely, things happen the way you plan. So you have to have contingencies, and the more experience you have, the better able you are to adjust on the fly. In fact, one of the reasons America did so well in World War II is because we were very flexible and we adjusted. And the other side was very, very strict and regimented in their planning and they didn't adjust as, as well. But in the jungle and in that environment in Vietnam, situational awareness, as we have said, uh, was everything. Hey, John, I'll make another comment about that. I was thinking about, we've all commented about giving respect to the people who work for us and hoping we get respect back from them. But one of the things that didn't get mentioned is respect for the enemy. And uh, uh, the people that we fought were really tough. And I can just relate one quick story. We had a, a B-52 bomb strike. They called them arc light strikes near Khe San. And flying in the morning, it was even difficult to see the ground because there was so, so much smoke and debris and stuff still in the air. And so we were a couple hundred feet up in the air. I didn't think anything could move down there. It looked like a moonscape. And uh, we were kind of flying relatively low, just someone in behind in the back of the helicopter was checking out what was happening. And uh, all of a sudden, some North Vietnamese soldier pops out of a bomb crater, drops down on one knee, and fires off one shot and then ducks back down in a hole. And I said, you know what, that's one tough son of a bitch. I bet blood was coming out of his nose. He probably couldn't hear for the rest of his life, and yet he had the guts to get out there and take a shot. So you'll learn to respect the enemy. That's a very good point. Uh, they really believed in what they were doing, which is part of our problem, I think. We had the best educated, worst disciplined army the world probably ever seen. But I remember in a base camp, I was living in a Michelin rubber plantation, and you hire local people to do things. We hired a guy who was a captain. We found out that he was a, a Viet Cong colonel. So what we did immediately, the MPs took him, put a sandbag on his head, put him in a Connex container out in the hot sun for a couple of days and see if he'd talk. He had maps on him, totally laid out as to our base camp, which leads to another comment. Because I was in the engineers, we built the stage and the... Uh, uh, the seating for the Bob Hope Show, <laughs> and which was very interesting. And uh, because we were doing it, the engineers, we built it, we'll get the best seats. So Bob Hope and, and uh, Neil Armstrong, I met Neil Armstrong, shook hands with him, was there, and Connie Stevens and Miss Universe and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, so Bob Hope gets up and he says, just want you to know, these nine guys in the front row, I wasn't part of them, come up on stage, and they were, they were grunts just got out of the bush, and they had discovered a whole series of 122 rockets and all kinds of stuff, perfect trajectory to the Bob Hope show. Now, this is super confidential stuff. When the Bob Hope arrives, how he arrives, everything else. And if these guys hadn't have found it, found this, this cache, cache, whatever it is, of weapons, the number of GIs would have been killed would have been extraordinary. And, uh, you know, I'll never forget that. But losing Bob Hope, my gosh, the country would be on fire with that. <laughs> but as I said, I shook hands with Neil Armstrong, so it was a positive side. It was said that um, in Vietnam, the two people they really had to worry about were the President of the United States and Bob Hope. 
and I'm not sure I had that order right. Um, Alex, do we have any questions? Do yeah, we have a couple from online. Uh, the first one is, when you were there as young men without the benefit of today's instant media, did you have conviction that you were doing the right thing? At what point did you have a thought, wow, maybe this isn't right? Okay, before all of you jump in, who wants to be first? <laughs> uh, I was there in uh, 65, 66, and 67. And at that time, we thought it was the right thing to do. I never came across anyone who said, should we really be here? We, we bought into it. For me, it wasn't until later that um, I said, why are we really here? Uh, what I wanted to do was to do my job, uh, to stay alive, and to do the best I could. Interesting thing that, that Jay said, not once did I, did I really think when I was there, as opposed to why I wanted to go there, that I was doing it for my country. It was all about your job and being there and doing your best job. I'm glad you, you raised that point. I assume that the others may agree with that as well. But anyway, that's how I respond to that. Uh, I agree with that. Uh, I don't think I even thought about it when I was there. Uh, I originally was in Da Nang. I got driven out of Da Nang by my father and my wife because my father was, became the largest Mars radio operator on the East Coast, and that's where you can work a ham radio from Da Nang to his apartment in Manhattan. He would then make a phone call from his radio to someone's home and then connect the trooper so they could talk on the telephone. But he used to call me every weekend, and with a time difference, he'd wake me up at 3 a.m., and then my wife would be there visiting him. It would be, hi, honey, over, hi, honey, over, how are you, honey, over, fine, over, can I go, can I go back to bed, over? And I figured the only way I could get out of this was to end up in Levang, where there was no ham radio. So that's one thing. But that's great. So my, my mind, I mean, it, it never entered. I figured they went to great effort to get me because out of the 15,000 guys who got activated, I was the only one who went to Vietnam which I didn't know at the time, but I knew that I was kind of unusual because my serial number was different than everybody else's, and everybody always wondered who I was because they thought I was somebody other than what I was because they couldn't believe that a reservist would be so stupid to be there. So it never entered my mind except I'm here, I got a job, it's over in, in X amount of days because it was 365 days and you were done. I had a calendar, I was busy knocking it all off, and life was going on. I mean, it, it wasn't nine to five, but it was a job. So it wasn't really until I got back in 69, uh, when the riots started and everything else like that, that I even realized, because obviously they didn't publish this stuff in the, whatever the, that military newspaper is. Uh, Stars and Stripes. Stars, Stars, and, Stars, Stars and, Stripes. and Stripes. They didn't publish all that stuff in Stars and Stripes. So I had no clue. And of course, you know, my family never, you know, said, why are you there? Because my father was a lieutenant commander of submarines in World War II. I was born in Little London. My sister was born in Annapolis. And uh, it never came up. That's interesting because you know, your question is interesting because I knew about it, thought how bad an idea it was when I was in college. And when you go to a funeral of a guy you went to high school with who was killed in Vietnam, it really just drives the sipping home. And you're saying to yourself, when is it going to be my turn? And uh, so way before I was drafted or anything else, I had a very bad feeling about it, a negative attitude towards the government as far as what the real mission was. And uh, it's just the way it hit me. When I got there, then it just amplified the whole thing. But as I said, going to a funeral of somebody you grew up with, I mean literally grew up with from the kindergarten through high school and uh, you know, was blown up by a grenade. That's tough to swallow at that age. I, I was thinking, uh, so we had a number of missions with uh, uh, South Vietnamese soldier uh, divisions. Uh, some were uh, particularly good. The Vietnamese Ranger battalions were quite good and others were not so effective and uh, it would you begin to think and crack jokes about it, which probably wasn't fair, but you'd say, 
I wonder who wants this more than they do. Maybe the enemy wants it more than the people that we're carrying in there. Now, now I know that's not fair. I want to make another comment about something. You know, you, we can sit here and sort of victimize ourselves in some way. 58,000 American men and, and some women died uh, in that war. You know, it was estimated that between two to three million South Vietnamese and North Vietnamese people died. Correct. Today, I believe there's 120, 130 missing in action. They haven't identified those. There's over 100,000 Vietnamese that they've never figured out where they are, who they are, what happened to them. This was a tough war. I think it came to me gradually coming home and then watching the behavior of our citizens. They weren't friendly to the soldiers, so I felt badly about that. But a couple of years later on, and it was too late for me, but gosh, what the heck are we doing here? What were we doing other than you know, killing people? You know, another interesting observation that I made, because I was in the engineers, uh, you know, we had to use plastic explosives and build bridges and know how to use all that kind of stuff. But one of the things you had to do, and I've, I've never lived with Southerners before, and one of the things you had to do, you had a bivouac for two weeks. And you get a half a tent, and you have to find a buddy with another half a tent. So I'm standing next to this guy. He was an African-American from Louisiana. His last name was Knight, K-N, I'm K-O. I said, why don't we bivouac together? I didn't think anything of it. Sure, we did. The Southerners from Georgia, Alabama could not comprehend that I would live in a tent, let alone drink out of the same canteen as an African-American soldier. It just, because again, growing up in a city, that's just part of my daily life. That really mm. caught me by surprise. I never had understood that. And seeing the differences of, of African Americans, I, you know, growing up in New York, we all know what, what, uh, what but Southern African Americans are some of the funniest, wonderful people I've ever lived with. I mean, these guys are, and you want somebody to get your back and protect you. Those guys were unbelievable. But running into that level of prejudice face mm -hmm. on and mm -hmm. how relevant it is today uh, really stood me up in my seat. One of the best interviewers I ever met um, was Tom Brokaw. And um, he once told me that when he did an interview, the last question was the question that he never asked. And he said, what I usually do is I ask my interviewee, what have I missed? What should I have asked you? The food? <laughs> yeah, I, no, I, I, ate better I, in co I ate better in Vietnam than I did in college. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't speak well for your meal plan. No, so. Yeah. <laughs> so, so one of the one of the structural difficulties of fighting in the Vietnam War was the uh, rotation system. And Tucky, uh, Preston, you mentioned this a little bit, but so I would show up on the first of January, nineteen sixty-eight, and uh, but I and then I'd go to my unit. That meant somebody went home. And, and there was sort of this flow of people in and out, which meant that you really had to be there for a couple of months to have what I call unit cohesion. And then as you got your year, you hopefully you'd get out at the end of a year, but it's around nine or 10 months, we use the term getting short. So you didn't have too much time left. You started to uh, think that way. Meanwhile, these people are just sort of coming in and out. So you avoided the people that just came in, even though you're supposed to train them, because you knew they weren't as skilled as you might have become, and so you didn't really want to fly with these guys because, yeah, you know, who knew what was going to happen. All that's just a myth. It's ridiculous. But that unit cohesion, I think, really interfered with how the Army and the Air Force and the Navy and Marines all operated. And uh, so that, that's one of my comments, that, I guess. That raises, uh, you know, an interesting reality, that whole rotation system mm -hmm. and everything. Uh, but as far as Tom Brokaw is concerned, mm -hmm. If you've never been in a service, you can never understand it. It's mm -hmm. just one of those things in life. Uh, people say, yes, I appreciate it, thank you for your service, et cetera, and that, that's great, I, I, I like that. But you really can't process it unless you were in it. Uh, it's, you know, it it's, that's why I'm concerned about Congress having the ability to declare war the like way they do. You've given me a perfect segue to um what will end our evening together. Uh, we've come together tonight to learn a little bit of a war that happened a world away. 
Question over there? Yes. John. On the left. I'm sorry. Your military right. <laughs> <laughs> That's your stage right. Hi, Ken Bernard. Uh, thank you for this wonderful expose and, and, and conversation. Um, I, I also served in the military, and when people ask me about it, I, uh, they, my comment, I say, I think the military was a great experience personally, and I think all of you are saying something similar in terms of a learning experience. And one of the things uh, why I, th I think the military is a good thing for young people is the amount of responsibility that you're given at a very uh, early age and it's just dumped on you. If you think of the soldiers we've sent over to Iraq, I mean, you have a 22 or 23 year old who's in charge of numbers of people, mil millions of dollars worth of equipment, and it's their job to handle it at that age. So I'm circling back to your own experiences where you might have encountered something like that. I was a JAG officer, and I showed up at Fort Dix where um, at least two of you um, uh, were, were, and the JAG, uh, uh, said, uh, uh, welcome, Captain Bernhardt. Here's your office. There's a stack of 20 files. I hear the directions to the stockade. You're on trial in two weeks. And I couldn't believe that I was going to be on trial. I had been a lawyer for just a very short period of time, and now I had a lot of responsibility defending a fellow. It, and, and the expression, you know, well, you fake it till you make it. Um, so my question of you is, can you recount an instance where you were thrown in totally unprepared um, and yet nevertheless had to uh, measure up uh, to the responsibility that you were given? I suspect some of it may be funny, some of it may be very serious, but I would really enjoy your own uh, personal stories of where you had to fake it till you, uh, till you made it. Let me try after that. First, I'd like to answer the question of What's the question that um, you should have asked? For me, it would be, and I'll get to Ken in one second, it would be after all you experienced, after what you learned about Vietnam and that we probably shouldn't have been there, and Iraq and Afghanistan, would you, as your father recommended to you, Tucker, join the service because the lessons you learned and also to give back to your country? And my answer after all of that is yes. I would. I don't have a son, but I would say yes, because I think it's a terrific experience for someone who was wet behind the ears as I was as a graduate at 22 years old from Dartmouth, and all of a sudden, you know, a month later, I'm in a firefight in Vietnam, and I have to learn, as we all talked, how to lead and work with people that you never knew before and all walks of life, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in terms of the question about the most dangerous thing or I don't like to talk about things like that, so I'll be very general. Uh, on my birthday uh, in February of 1966, I was on a patrol, um, actually on the Way River, and we pulled in on my patrol boat. Fortunately, we had 250 caliber machine guns, and we were attacked. I won't go through it. Uh, I don't like to talk about it, but uh, let's just say that it was very dangerous. Uh, I almost lost one of my people. They almost died. Um, but we won, won, won the, uh, the hour. I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, I'll answer the question uh, because I'm the classic example of what the military should not do. Uh, I went from selling steel in, out of Manhattan uh, to going to Vietnam within a base, basically a six-week period with no training whatsoever. Okay? because uh, I was a reservist. So I didn't even have, I had had basic uh, three years in, earlier than that, in radio school, et cetera, and then I had nothing in my, in my summer camps. One was in Cape Cod and one was in Western Massachusetts. And I remember once, I think I asked my wife for money because the Shirelles were up at one of the places and I wanted to go see the concert and I didn't have enough money. So now I get to Vietnam and so now I'm a radio operator with these four, uh, three facts, the airplanes, and I'm controlling them as they control the fighters. So I had no experience in any of this stuff. So the answer to your question was, was that any of us put into a position of where you didn't know what was going on and you quickly had to learn what was going on and you had responsibility for people at the same time? The answer is, yeah, I was the classic example of that. 
but you, you know, you're thrown into it, you don't have any options. I mean, you can't, you know. Uh, in those days, they didn't have uh, YouTube and Google. <laughs> so basically, it's, it's OJT, you know, on the job training. Which raises an interesting thought, because a lot of people have asked me that question since I was drafted. Do I believe in the draft? Absolutely, I believe in the draft. Because it makes you do things you don't want to do. And there are a lot of people, and having clients all different sizes and shapes, with kids basically, you know, trust babies, whatever you want to call them, have had to do a lot of things. If they didn't want to do it, they didn't. So I think the draft really shapes up people, mm -hmm. and, it, and you get to see what the rest of the country is all about. To, to meet and live with people from all over this country. Right. And uh, it's just a very good experience. One, one funny story, my mother had sent me Jiffy Pop. We all remember what that is. So if you look at what's called a Claymore mind and you cut out the back of it, and there are ball bearings in this thing, this thing is pretty deadless, but the basic explosive is kind of like sterno. So I'd cut it out, you light it, and I'm doing this Jiffy Pop thing. And we were living with some Cambodians who were tunnel rats at the time, and they had no idea seeing this thing get bigger and bigger, and you're going to eat it? <laughs> you know, it was, but again, that's good experience about culture and, and ideas, and, and the draft to me is, would be a very important thing to bring back. And I, as you see in the paper today, papers recently, they're thinking about having women register for the draft, and I totally agree with that. It's something so you understand this country better. And maybe we'll avoid some of the mistakes we made if you've got a son or daughter. Jake? Okay. Yeah, uh, to Ken's point, that uh, sense of uh, responsibility. So in my unit, I was 23. A couple of enlisted uh, NCOs were a little older than I was. The company commander was a few years older than I was. but. Uh, you know, I was probably on the older side. I was above median in terms of age. And you're thrust into these uh, situations. Uh, uh, first, as a pilot, you get trained to fly, land, take off, use a radio a little bit. But once you're there, you had no idea what the helicopter could do until you actually had to make it work. And, uh, uh, and then you're responsible for people that are on your plane, but you're also responsible for the flight behind you maybe responsible for the people on the ground, you're communicating with senior officers above uh, in any given situation. And it can happen in an instant because you don't know when something is going to be called and you have to go in there. And, uh, and you do it. It's, uh, uh, and even at the lowest level, I do this at the Bedford School when we talk to the younger kids, in the Army, the smallest unit is a rifle team. It's two people. And it's almost like a cowboy and Indian movie. Cover me, Joe, and the guy shoots a little bit, and then you move forward and back and forth, uh, which is called a, uh, a, uh, a maneuver. Um, but what that says is I'm responsible for Joe, and Joe is responsible for me. And you never really think about that, I think. Certainly I never did in college or anything leading up to that. And then all of a sudden you realize that person's really counting on me. That responsibility is, is right in there. And... Uh, uh, I think the military brings that right out very quickly. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I don't want to walk over anybody else's question. Anyone else? Yep, we got one more here. Go ahead. <clears throat> Thanks. I'd, I'd like to ask you a question, not so much about your time in Vietnam, but uh, about what you did in your 30s, 40s, and 50s. And it's, it's personal for me because I've got a 31-year-old who uh, went from Lejeune to Hellman eager, so eager, and came back with questions, why, why, all the things that happened. Is there any sort of words of advice you might have for how do you live your life and incorporate your life as you were in your middle age? I'm still working on it, but uh, <laughs> can you didn't quite hear all question? of the I couldn't question. quite hear yeah, the, could question. You summarize the question. Could you summarize that for us? I, it's something yeah, about sure, sure. 30s so, and 40s and so, uh, how yeah, so, 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 you know, um, it's absolutely fascinating what you guys did in your youth, but when you were, you know, middle-aged, how did you incorporate your experience and address it as, as you were fathers and, um, you know, people living in town. Uh, let me take I, a stab at it. Go ahead. Go ahead I, I, I think I can, I can uh, re refer you to the recording of the 
prior series of questions yeah. that we had. The guys talked about that at great length. Um, they played it forward. They used what they did in the military to set benchmarks for themselves, and they took the experiences that they had there and incorporated them into their lives. Each one of them was very different, but all of them, I think, had the same kind of, of, of evolution that the military added to their, their bag of tricks, whether they were a banker or a lawyer or a guy in the steel business. They took lessons forward. Any mm -hmm. question? Yes, thank you for humanizing um, what you do in the service. I mean, I was really touched. I, I came here for another reason to the library this evening, and I happened to overhear the interview, and I was like, oh, wow, this is amazing. And I'm very impressed, and thank you very much for all you've done. Um, my question, I'm a nurse, so I, I know trauma, so I can not necessarily relate, because I was never in the military, but I understand trauma. Um, and what's going to be the future for the military, particularly with, with climate change and everything? I hear that the military is trying to get involved with climate change, but do you have any feelings about that or any ideas from your experience since you, you know, are in different parts of the, of the, of the globe? Um, and just kind of what's the future? Because we talk about the past, but what's the future? Well, my sense of the military today is, in terms of manpower, it's a, it's a fraction of what it was during the Vietnam era. And, uh, but it's probably 10 times more powerful uh, through technology, perhaps training, the, uh, uh, the uh, level of education and dedication of a volunteer army uh, versus a draft army. Um, how do you get into climate change? I think people bring that with them. Um, I'm also struck by saying flying helicopters, the ones that I flew, uh, they don't even, nobody uses those things anymore. The newer ones are bigger, more powerful, and probably use less fuel. Now, I don't know if that's a climate change issue or not for you. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you know, if you really think about the global issues of things, climate change is going to drive the next series of serious wars. It's, it's driving immigration. It's going to force countries to... Uh, and they're taking action already in a military sense to prevent that. Uh, I think we're living on the cusp of a, a, a catastrophe through climate change. I think that's a, that's a really thoughtful question because when you saw it a lot of times, Jay, flying around, when you see these big craters from B-52 strikes uh, and how we devastated the land with deforestation and stuff like that, it, you, know, you weren't aware of it at the time, you thought this is the right thing to do, but you reflect back on it. And what we did to South Vietnam from an environmental point of view was just incredible. Uh, and and um, it's gonna take them a long time, I think, to recover that. One thing I found interesting, we, I never saw any birds. There were no birds in Vietnam, lots of bugs, but no birds. Uh, and I don't know if that's a result of Agent Orange or whatever this stuff is, but uh, I think you can use, though, the military, if you don't run into union problems, use the military to work on some of these climate issues because you've got forced labor, skilled labor. <laughs> so it is what it is. I look at the engineers. The things the first engineer battalion could do was unbelievable. You turn you know, 600 guys with all this equipment loose on the South Bronx, and they could rebuild it. it it's just, <laughs> but, you know, unions will never let that happen, but that's a separate issue. But. Uh, Preston, I think that that's a, that's a, a story for another evening. You bet it is. <laughs> Any uh, last questions? Can I just offer? Sure. I, I'm kind of pessimistic. Uh, I don't think the military is terribly sensitive about the environment, probably, mm -hmm. uh, period. And I don't think they will be go forward. Uh, every war that's been fought, that's been the least of uh, concerns, whether you totally destroyed Europe or, you know, what happened in World War I and World War II and in Vietnam as Preston alluded to, with uh, Agent Orange destroying trees everywhere. Uh, I think the, the military, I hope I'm wrong, go forward, isn't very uh, sensitive about the environment. Are we there? Evening, gentlemen. Uh, so I'm uh, a Marine veteran. I was over in Afghanistan 10 years ago when it became our longest war, so sorry to take the title away from you guys. 
Um, but I, I was just uh, wondering if you guys witnessed any um, acts of sabotage by American soldiers or anything like that over there sabotaging the American war effort, or if you knew anyone who was in the American Servicemen's Union or ever encountered any of those uh, pamphlets or newspapers or anything like that. I, we had one experience uh, that I remember because I was in part of the headquarters company is we had a you know a, a young soldier kind of flip out go crazy I don't know if he was high on anything because there are a lot of drugs over there and he's and uh, he just jumped in a bunker and shot six Americans. Hmm. Uh, and then another night, I remember, this is New Year's Eve, two guys had a little too much Jack Daniels. They're back to back, they strapped on 45s, and you know, did 20 paces and turned around and shot at each other. You know, it's, yeah, there, there, there were things that people did, not by design, sabotage, I don't think I saw sabotage but I sure saw other things or heard of other things that were, you know, pretty challenging to listen to. Yeah, the stories that I recall, but I didn't see this, uh, and I think this started to happen in 69 and 70 and, and towards the end of the war, uh, where the officers were often attacked uh, with uh, grenades. And uh, um, other than that, though, uh, those are just things that I, I heard. I'm, I'm sure they all happened, but... Not, not when I was there. Me either. Last question. Have any of you been back? And if so, what was it like? Uh, I've been back. Uh, actually, I did a bike trip uh, with my wife. And uh, I think it was with Backroads. Was it Backroads? It was Backroads out of California. Uh, for 12 or 13 days, it was terrific. Uh, we thoroughly, I thoroughly enjoyed it. We thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, then I went back with some friends who live in Hong Kong for, I can't remember how long, maybe seven or eight days. Uh, and we were, we started, we were in Hanoi, but then we ended up down in Wei. Uh, they wouldn't let me back into, I, actually I wanted to get back where I was, but they wouldn't let me in there. So we did Wei, and I think we did, I'm not sure if we did Saigon or not, and that was, interesting. And my wife actually went with my sister for three or four days. Uh, they were visiting in Hong Kong and I don't know, we took a side trip. I'm not sure she enjoyed it. She didn't like the food. But uh, great beaches. I mean, if you want to go, I mean, I always said, you know, if anybody ever developed this place, it'd be fabulous because the beaches are spectacular. <laughs> uh, the food's good if you like pho and uh, whatever. It's really good food. And the people are uh, relatively friendly, you know, considering, considering what they went through, they're amazingly friendly, uh, and they're friendly. It was, uh, you know, an interesting place. Interesting place. You think you would have said that 50 years ago? I don't think so. I would the day I got out. <laughs> so we've come together tonight to learn a little bit about a war that was a world away. Um, we have four survivors who I think represent a pretty good cross-section of the people who served. Um, it is possible, uh, and this evening is evidence of that, to celebrate the warriors and not war. Uh, when asked in an interview several years ago what his job was as a senior military officer, the late great warrior and statesman Colin Powell said, I work every day to put myself out of business. The military's job is peace. Gentlemen, thank you for the, world, the moments of peace your contributions have afforded the rest of us. And above all, welcome home. <laughs> thank you.